people said? Amen. 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 We're in a series called That's Why We Pray. And you go, hey, that sounds a little bit like an, uh, an MC Hammer song. And you're right. Because that's how cool I am. Although, after I made this, this is our second week in this, last week I talked about it, somebody's like, hey, my thing, it's that's word we pray. But I'm not for sure, I'm not a gangster rapper, I'm not for sure what he says, it sounds like that's why we pray, but uh, just, just, just know MC Hammer inspired this. <laughs> How cool is that, huh? That's why we pray. Pray! Because uh, I said, man, if MC Hammer knows how to pray, we should too, alright? That's the only reason we're doing this. So before we get into the sermon today, I heard something this week I wanted to share with you. In order for you to be born, in order for you to be born, you needed two parents, four grandparents, eight great-grandparents, 16 great-grandparents, 32 third great-grandparents, 64 fourth great-grandparents, 128 fifth great-grandparents, 256 sixth great-grandparents, 512 seventh great-grandparents, 1,024 eighth great-grandparents, 2,048 ninth great-grandparents. For you to be born today from 12 previous generations, you need 4,000 94 ancestors over the last 400 years to get you to this place today. Is that crazy? Yeah. Think about all the trials, the struggles, the pain, the work, the tears, the joy, the laughter, the hurt, the hope. Every piece that God had to put together, that he had to move around. All these things that he had to do to make sure that you were here today. To hear this message that could change somebody's life. And, and, and the person whose life will be changed today could impact generations for the next 400 years. Here's my point. Thank you for being here. I don't know why you're here. I don't know how you got here. But I believe that God placed you here today for a reason. And if you'll listen with an open heart and an open mind, I believe that you will be able to understand that God is working ahead of you for this message, to prepare this message for you. And I think something incredible is going to happen today. So if you came in here broken, hurt, upset, struggling, something with your life, like, listen, this is the right place to be. All right? I've been reading my Bible since I was 9 or 10 years old. And, and I'm talking, we, we got the King James Bible when I was a kid. Now these kids get like comic books, Bibles, and I don't understand. We got the real one, you know what I'm saying? The King James Bible. Couldn't understand any of it, but I read it. You know what I'm saying? And, 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 and I'll even say this. I'll even go back further. 1988, November 1st. All Saints Day, my birthday. I was born that day. It was a Tuesday. You better believe that my mom had me in church that Sunday. If I even... She probably had me in Bible study on Wednesday if I know my mom. Like, this is the thing. We were in church all the time. Every time the door was open, and, and listen, I almost didn't make it as a kid. I had my, my mom, my umbilical cord was wrapped around my throat. So that's what my mom, my mom said. That's why I got a loud mouth, okay? Because I, I almost didn't make it, okay? I couldn't breathe. But here's the thing. But like, we were at church all the time. Since I was a baby, we were at church. We, we went to everything. Every time the doors were open, I went to revivals. I went to Sunday school. We went to morning service, night service, Wednesday night service, RA, GAs, church plays, katadas, you name it. The Crozers were there. Every, like, when we went to Trinity when I was a kid, and me and Asa, we know every nook and cranny in this entire building. You want to know why? Because we would crawl under these pews and we'd run around the place while they had, you know, choir practice or whatever. We were here all the time. And, and, and here's the point, guys. I even think my name's written under one of them. If you look real close to them. Okay, but my point is this, every miracle that I've ever read about in the Bible, every miracle that I've ever heard about in a sermon or saw testified at the church, every miracle had one thing in common, and it wasn't faith. I, I've seen people who doubted God still receive a miracle. I, it wasn't even prayer. I have, seen, I have seen people receive miracles that never asked for one. The one thing every miracle had in common was they all started with a problem. All of them. Now listen, I'm not the smartest guy in the room, I, I know that, but I would assume that everybody in here has some sort of problem going on in their life right now. How many of y'all are dealing with a problem? How many of you are set by your problem? I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Oh, boy. Now you have a problem. You're wrong. You know what I'm saying? But, but here's my point. I don't care what you're going through. The Bible says, like, he doesn't say, he doesn't say, thank God for all things. It says, thank God in all things. In all things. Yeah. And so I just pray that you leave here today with the knowledge and understanding that God is, is going to do something special in your life. And so if you have your Bibles with you today, if you have your Bibles, we're going to be looking at uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2. 
First Timothy chapter two, one through eight. First Timothy chapter two, one through eight. God is a better version of life alert. Y'all remember life alert? Help, I've fallen and I can't get up. Y'all remember that? You push a little button and they say, what's wrong? Help, I've fallen and I can't get up. There are Christians who have fallen in life. They can't get up. And instead of waiting for, for, for somebody to help you get up, listen, we can go directly to our Father and ask for His help. See, sometimes I think you all go, hey, I got, I got problems, but I got to wait till Sunday to tell you. Because I got to have you pray for, for me on my behalf. Can I tell you all something? I don't have any special access to God that you don't have. You have the same access to God that I have. And so, so be pay attention to this. God is a prayer away. And I hope we get this understanding today. So let's all stand for reading this holy word. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. First of all. Then I urge that requests and prayers and intercessions and thanksgiving be made in behalf of all people, for kings and all who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator also between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all the testimony given at the proper time. For this I was appointed as a preacher and an apostle. I'm telling the truth. I am not lying as a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and in truth. Therefore, I want the men in every place to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger and dispute. May God bless you with his holy word. You may be seated. In this passage, we see a call to prayer. A call to prayer. What a great reminder. If there was ever a time to be in prayer, now is that time. We survived in another election. The culture has lost its mind. Our communities are falling apart. We need prayer today Amen. more than ever. And so look at this passage. I want to talk about two reasons today for why we need prayer. Number one, we pray because we're in a spiritual battle. You heard said We pray because we're in a spiritual battle. Everybody says, hey, the world's out of control. How can we ever make a difference? How can Trinity fix, fix our society? How can we change the trajectory of our country? Some people will even say, we are too far gone. To, to go back to anything. We're too far gone. We just need to wait for God to come back. Then you have the other side of, the, of Christians who just blame the devil for everything. Everything's the devil's fault. The devil's attacking me. The devil's overcoming me. The devil's doing this. The devil's doing that. And nothing makes me more sick than when we give the devil all the credit. I don't know why we do this. And I want to preach this till I'm, I'm, I'm dead. Stop giving the devil all the credit. There's a Christian band I know and follow. And every day they, they always post how the devil's attacking them. And how the devil's doing this. And the devil's working against us. And they go, we're doing, we're doing something right. Because the devil's attacking us. Whoa. That, that, that doesn't make sense what you're saying. And they'll even point to examples. They go, somebody broke into our van. And stole all of our very priceless equipment. Donate. The devil's attacking us. And then I go, oh, that's what they want. They want the money. I see. Every time the devil attacks us, they get a big, large sum of money. Because somebody got stole. Something got stole. It blows my mind. But see, it, it's gross. Because in giving the devil all this credit, listen to me, church, you're denying the fact that Jesus went to the cross and defeated the devil. He defeated him. He was defeated over 2,000 years ago. We have to learn, we have to learn to rebuke him and enter into the triumph of Jesus' victory. Will the devil attack our non-believing neighbors? You better believe he will. Will he, will he try to take over our corrupt systems and our culture? Absolutely. Will he try to attack the younger generation? He's doing it. But let me tell you something. Does the devil have any authority over Abraham Crozier? No. Because I've been washed by the blood of Jesus Christ. I am a new creation. And if the devil is attacking me, the Bible tells us what to do. We're to pray. We're to pray. We're to rebuke them. We're to tell them to get behind us in the name of Jesus. Guys, there's a spiritual warfare going on. We need to be in prayer. This week, people went to the polls to vote, and some of us get upset with politicians who get voted in. It's the same thing all the time. We get upset. We think that, that, they, that, that, that politicians control our lives. We get defeated, frustrated. We're in shock. But here's the thing. This passage is clear. We need to be in prayer. We need to pray for the politicians who are in office. That they have a revelation with God. That God intervenes in the direction of our community and country. That God will use them to help us continue to make a difference for him. Here's what, here's what I want to point out, though. And this is going to mess up a lot of people. Because we think with the power of social media, our opinions matter. Yeah, I know y'all get quiet when I talk about social media. Y'all think your opinion matters. 
And, and, and we got our, our yes corner that always comments on every post we make. And, and I'm going to go unfiltered here and I'm going to make my post. And everybody goes, you say it, you tell them, you got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the ones that disagree with us, y'all hit that block button. You know what I'm saying? There ain't nobody that disagrees with you on your friends list because you blocked all the ones that disagree with you. And, and, and here's the thing. Our job is not to block people who disagree with us. Our job is to reach those who disagree with us. Because everybody needs to hear this redemptive message of Jesus Christ. Democrats need Jesus. Republicans need Jesus. The mayor needs Jesus. Joe Biden, Donald Trump, both of them need Jesus. The scared single mom who can't catch a break needs Jesus. The father's working 70 hours to pay for child support. He needs Jesus. So, so if we get into petty arguments all the time and we're blocking people or making people block us, how can we as Christians reach them? We're in a spiritual battle. Our country's in a spiritual battle. And instead of sitting there in our churches singing songs like Reckless Love, I don't know why we always go, everybody's singing Reckless Love. I can't find anywhere in the Bible where it says God loves Reckless, but we keep singing Kumbaya, Reckless Love. Let me tell you something. We cannot sit there in our churches with all the lights and the cameras. Most of our churches look like entertainment nowadays. But when we do what Scripture tells us, get on our knees, beg to a holy God for healing, beg to a holy God for building up His people, Beg to a holy God that our families will finally surrender their lives to Him. Titus chapter 3, 1 through 9 emphasizes this. This chapter is even called How to Live a Godly Life. You want to, you want to learn how to live a godly life? Write this down. Titus chapter 3, 1 through 9. It says, Remind them to be subject to rulers, to authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good deed, to slander no one. To slander no one, not to be contentious, to be gentle, showing every consideration for all people. For we too were once foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another. But when the kindness of God our Savior and His love for mankind appeared, He saved us not on the basis of deeds which we did in righteousness, but in accordance with His mercy, by the washing of the regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom He richly poured out upon us through Christ Jesus our Savior, so that being justified by His grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This statement is trustworthy, and concerning these things, I want, to, I want you to speak confidently, so that those who have believed God will be careful to engage in good deeds. These things are good and beneficial for people, but avoid controversies and genealogies and strife and disputes about the law, for they're useless and they're worthless. We have to understand, church, we have to be able to show grace because we have been shown grace. We have to be able to love people because we were loved by Christ. And we cannot be hateful, awful, disobedient, hypocritical Christians and then expect our non-believing friends to start listening to us when we want to talk to them about God. Doesn't work that way. So before we start to complain, go to God in prayer. Before we start to yell, go to God in prayer. Before we argue, before we post, go to God in prayer. Before you text somebody, go to God in prayer. Before you go to work, you better go to God in prayer. Before you get home and step a foot inside your house, because your kids and your wife, they're probably going crazy inside, you better go to God in prayer. Amen. You understand what I'm saying? Before you leave church today, you all better go to God in prayer. Ephesians chapter 6, starting on verse 11, says, Put on the full armor of God so that you'll be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. Now hold on. Now all these Christians give the devil all the credit. Did we not just read that we, if we put on the full armor of God, we can stand against the schemes of the devil? If he's attacking you, guess what you don't have on? Come on, guys. If the devil attacks you, what do you not have on? Woo! Put on the full armor of God so you can stand against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against powers, against the world forces of this darkness, the spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you may be able to resist on the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. We continue with verse 18. It says, with every prayer and request, pray at all times in the spirit and with this in view, be alert with all perseverance and every request for all the saints and pray in my behalf that speech may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel for which I'm an ambassador in change that I'm proclaiming it I may be boldly and speaking it as I ought to speak. Paul was so serious about praying for the spiritual battle that we're constantly facing. 
that in our main passage, he said to pray for all men. Not some men, not the men we like. He said, pray for all men. Pray for the kings and those in authority. Listen, I'm not, I'm not a fan of old man Joe. But you better believe I'm going to pray that he can finish his sentence today. I'm going to pray that he doesn't screw anything up in the office. You understand what I'm saying? And I'm going to pray for Joe Biden like I pray for Donald Trump, like I pray for Barack Obama, like I pray for George Bush, like you guys probably prayed for Abraham Lincoln when some of y'all were younger. <laughs> Because all people need prayer. And, and here's the thing, guys. No one is too far gone. No one is too far gone for God to reach. So we pray because we're in a spiritual battle. Number two, another reason we pray is the salvation of everyone. We pray for the salvation of everyone. I don't want you to miss this. We don't pray for the salvation of just church people. You understand this? Our job is not to be a church filled with church people. That's the day I'm out of here. I don't want to be a church filled with church people. I've been to a million churches that are just filled with only church people. It's miserable. Everybody hates each other. Everybody looks at each other like they're mad at each other. They all cross their arms and listen to the sermon because they've already heard it. Don't judge me. I'm a Christian. I'm a church person. I don't. I, church people make me sick to my stomach. They know everything. They're better than everybody else. Uh, they want the church to look exactly like they did when they got saved in 1923. Don't change it. It was good back when I got saved in 1923. And, and this is my point, guys. This, this is a problem that we're seeing over and over again. We don't pray for just church people. Amen. We don't pray for just the salvation of our families, which we need to do. We need to go to God on behalf of our families because our families are being attacked and destroyed. But that's not the only thing we should be praying for. Right. Paul said we should be praying for the salvation of all people. This is God's heart and his desire. All people. Amen. As a pastor, I deal a lot with death. And we're in an area where even though we got like 45 churches, a church, we have a church on every block, it seems like. It seems like we there's not pastors that aren't always available. So I get a lot of phone calls to do funerals. I did a funeral uh, on Thursday with a two-year-old girl. And if you ever, I'll tell you, watching a mother grieve over a child is the most heartbreaking thing to ever watch. It's the most heartbreaking thing to, to minister to. But here's the thing, guys. With death comes a question. Every funeral I've ever got, there's always a question. Somebody always asks me that question. Why? Why? Why did God allow this to happen? Why did God take away my son? Why did God take away my best friend? Why did God take away my cousin who was an atheist and didn't get any chance to witness to him? We don't like to talk about death. Because most of us want to live on this earth forever. But the reality is, death is coming. It's coming for all of us. But, but this is the one, the one reason that we as a church need to have some type of sense of urgency in getting this message of salvation out to our community. Amen. Because death is coming. Let's get as many people as we can to get to heaven. Amen. Secondly, this is why some of you in here need to repent and give your life to Christ. Because tomorrow's not promised. It seems like more people are getting cancer than any other time that I can recall. It seems like more people are dying from heart failure than any other time than I can recall. Here's my point. Life can take a turn at a moment's notice. And listen, I'm a huge NASCAR fan. A couple, couple weeks ago, last week, there was a, the Xfinity Championship. Ty Gibbs was running for the championship. His, his grandfather owns Joe Gibbs Racing. His dad is Coy Gibbs, and he's about to take over the family business. He's going to take over Joe Gibbs Racing. Joe Gibbs was a, used to be an old football coach. He's about to take over the, the, the company. His, his son just won this championship, x championship. He was on top of the world. Two hours later, his dad dies in his sleep. Here, his dad's going to take over the company, has a bright future for himself. His son just won Xfinity championship, getting ready to go to the, the big show. And two hours into his sleep, he falls, he falls asleep. And he dies. And he never wakes up again. I'm telling you, life can turn in a moment's notice. And here's the thing, guys. We serve an older community. Falmouth is not getting any younger. So we're going to see more sickness. We're going to see more death, more empty houses, more empty businesses. And so this message of salvation is more urgent now than ever before, not only in our country, but right here in Falmouth. Now, now here's where I disagree with a lot of Christians. Because there's a lot of Christians that are always pointing to an event Every event that happens in life, they point to it and say, it's, this is the sign of the end of the world. They stub their toe and blood starts pouring out everywhere. 
And they go, look, there's blood in the water. The world's about to end. No, you stubbed your toe. You know, it's gross. Clean it up. You know? The election, oh, the election, every election, this is it. This is the, this is the one that doesn't go right. This is the end of the world, you know? We see this over and over again. And, and here's what I want you guys to pay attention to. Okay? Not everything that happens is a prophecy being fulfilled. But look what the Bible says in, 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 in 2 Peter chapter 3, 7 through 9. By his word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly people. It's coming. It's going to happen. But, but, verse 8 says, but do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not willing for anyone to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Listen to me. This is the calling card for Christians. You want to know why it's time to get to work as a Christian? Because God is being patient, not wanting anybody to perish. That means we got some work to do. Amen. We got some people to get saved. Right. As much as Christians want the world to end and God to destroy everything in his way, God is being patient. Why? He doesn't want anybody to perish. He wants everybody to come to repentance. That is his desire. That's his desire. But let me tell you this. As much as he doesn't want you to go to hell, he's not going to force anybody to love. This is why he gives us the freedom to choose him or reject him. And listen, I'm going to draw the line in the sand for a lot of you guys here today. You need to make that choice today. Are you going to sit there and receive Jesus Christ or are you going to reject him? Because if you reject him and walk out these doors and something happens to you, guess where you end up? Hell! That is a hard reality. But God does not want that. This is why he brought you here today. He wants you to receive him as your Lord and Savior. He wants you today to say, look, you know what? I want to surrender my life to you, God. You cannot blame God for anybody going to hell because he gives us the means and the way out of hell. He gives it to us. Read, read, read this passage over and over again because he didn't say he wanted some people to have salvation. You understand this? He didn't say I just want a certain amount of you to have salvation. He said I want all people to have salvation. All people. Listen, this screws up. I have countless friends who are like, hey, there are some people who are just predestined for heaven, predestined for hell. No, 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 this screws that up. That screws up that message. These verses screw up all the rules and the regulations, you know, of the Catholic Church. You don't have to go through any sacraments or, or sign any documents or give a certain amount of money or get sprinkled in order to, to get to heaven. You understand that? Listen, pay attention. God wants everybody, Amen. everybody to have salvation. And he's made it easy for us. Yeah. He did the hard part when he went to the cross. He made it easy for us, Christianity is not a country club. That's just for some people. There's not a group of people that's been elected by God to be saved. How do I know that? Because over and over again we see that this is God's desire and his heart for all people to be saved. Jesus went to the cross not for some people. He went to the cross for all people. Right? Anyone who's willing to confess with their mouth, believe in their heart, repent of their sinful lifestyle, he came for you. And you say, how is that possible? Paul tells us in verse 5. There's one God, one mediator also between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus. The worst witness that any Christian could ever say is something that I've heard my entire life in Christian circles. This is the worst Christian witness that I've ever heard, and I've heard it my entire life. They, they, they always go, look, I'm a Christian because if I'm wrong, I'll just end up in the dirt. But if you're wrong, You'll end up in hell. And some of y'all may have said that yourself. Some of you may have justified your faith that way. But let me tell you something. That's an awful witness. Because there is no if I'm wrong. Right. We're Christians because we know. Right. We know that Christ lived and died. We know it. We know that he died on the cross for our sins. We know that he's risen. He's sitting on the right hand of God. We know that we're saved because we're covered by his blood. We know. Amen. Nobody else is coming. Y'all, I want you to pay attention to this. We, we're always sitting there waiting for the brighter day. We said our church is going, there's a brighter day coming, so, you know, the, we're going to finally elect somebody that we're going to like, we're going to sit there and, and do something, the church is going to start doing revival, there's a brighter day coming, we keep saying this, there's a brighter day coming, we're waiting for the brighter day, Christ already came, right. and listen, it's victory, he brought victory, Amen. that brighter day is here, Amen. he died on the cross for us, and gave us victory over death, we're like, it's here, the brighter day, you're living it. This is a beautiful moment because we have victory if you have Christ in your life. Jesus saved the day, died on the cross. He gave us his Holy Spirit. 
We don't have to look towards government to change our country because Jesus gave us the keys to victory. The local church may not look like much, but God put the local church here to go to war, to disciple, to train, to equip, to reach the world for him. And when he comes back again, we'll be ready. We'll be ready. But let me tell you something, guys. Our community is God's. It's not the devil's. Your marriage is God's. It's not the devil's. The church is God's, not the devil's. Your family is God's. Not the devil's. So stop giving your family and your marriage and our community over to the devil. The question is, are you going to give up all these things so the devil can have them? Or are you going to stand and say, God, I'm going to pray every moment of every day for you to have your way with all these things. Because the problem we've been having, and I'll start to wrap it up, but the problem we've been having in the church is we've been fed a lot of information, but we're not using it for anything. There are some of you guys that have sat in church longer than I've even been alive. And you've heard way more sermons than I've ever heard. But you've done nothing with it. We're not taking it and strengthening our prayer life. We're not using this information and transforming our social media to reflect the social media dedicated to benefiting God's kingdom. We're not using it to share the gospel with those around us. We take in all this information and then we just sit there. This is why Christians have such big heads. You know what I'm saying? Arrogant minds. Very little fruit. Nowhere in the Bible does God say our churches should be stagnant or in decline or failing or empty. And the ones that are, they're, they're sitting there crying, going, I don't know where God is. I don't know why God's not bringing revival to our church. I don't know why God's not growing our church. Where's all the attenders? Let me tell you something. Instead of crying about it, we've got to start praying about it. Instead of crying about how your family doesn't follow God, why don't you get to the altar and start praying about it? I want to give you a, ge a genealogy or a, a, a geology lesson real quick. I think we'll emphasize this point I heard from a guy named Pastor Vlad. He talked about the place where Jesus ministered. There are two seas. And you can, you can visit both these places today. The Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea. The Sea of Galilee has the Jordan, or the Jordan River flowing into it and it has it flowing out of it. All right? But the Dead Sea, the Jordan River flows into it, but nothing flows out. Nothing flows out. That's why the Dead Sea has a lot of minerals. But no fish. Has a lot of minerals, but it has no fish. A lot of Christians have minerals and no fish in their life. Christians have a lot of knowledge, but they have no fruit. There's very little spiritual growth. Why? Because everything flows in, nothing flows out. Great inflow, no outflow. Most churches want to count you as an attender today. Most churches will pat you on the back for showing up on a Sunday. Congratulations, you did your Christian duty. We'll see you next week. And if you tithe, we'll give you two pats on the back. You've done your Christian duty. That is not what we believe here at Trinity. Our vision is to be a church on the move for a reason. Because we want you to take what you learn here and take it out into the world. I want you to, I want you to pray for people in your workplace. I want you to pray for the person you come into contact with at the gas station. I want you to pray for that waitress that's going to serve you today. I want, I, want you to, I want you to pray for your family. I want you to pray for this church. I want you to pray for your pastor. I want you to pray for our communities. Why do we pray on, on with this, guys? Jeremiah 33, 3. Jeremiah 33, 3. God says to Jeremiah, he said, call to me, and I will answer you, and I will tell you great and mighty things which you do not know. You ever see that? Call to me, and I will answer you, and I will tell you great and mighty things which you do not know. God wants to do a great and amazing thing for you. He wants to transform your life forever. And today, all you have to do is surrender your life to Him. Believe in your heart. Confess with your mouth. Repent of your sins. That's it. See, but here's the thing. We want to do a part of that, not the other. We don't mind confessing with our mouth, but we have a hard time believing in our heart. Or we want to believe in our heart, but we have a hard time repenting of our sins. you got to do all three in order to surrender to Him today. And so as we come to a close here, I want everybody to bow their heads and close their eyes. As we go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Remember, dear Father God, I know there's somebody here today, God, that walked in here out, of the, out, out from, that, from that community today, God, looking for an answer, looking for some, for some peace in their life, God, looking for some clarity in their life, God. I just pray, God, that today they walk out here going, I came here for a reason.